you know like if you tell me a story once and then slip up and tell somebody beside me later on and those stories don't match my old perspective of you just changed you know like when that stuff happens like red flags go up big time. and me. I guarantee I'm wrong something in which Peterson defines that as paranormal that's that's the dangerous side of being a person like that is you're not always right right Welcome to the Country Boy Book Club, where we take the time to really enjoy life and become a little bit better every day. And what that really means is focusing on the whole picture. We are focused on improving our mental, physical, spiritual, and financial well-being, and we love for you to come with us on this journey. In this series, we cover Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life and Antidote to Chaos. We're happy you're here and can't wait to hear what you're getting out of this book. Join the conversation. <laughs> um, so let's let's go ahead and get into it, man. Um, and and by that, what I want to do is I want to read you the rules up to the rule that we're working on today. Um, you know, I've, as we've discussed in. in previous episodes uh it's fairly important and useful to you know kind of reinforce the things that we've been over um i for one have a terrible memory i've always had i've always had a terrible memory like i've struggled with it as a kid and you know my wife likes to uh bring to my attention how bad my memory is and and doesn't understand or believe that yeah it's always been this bad but it has and i know i'm not alone so at the very least for my benefit and yours i'm going to read the rules up to the one that we're working on today rule number one stand up straight with your shoulders back that's a huge one right like i've been doing that on a regular basis for whatever reason the last time you know the last couple times we revisited this rule um, you know, it's stuck now for some reason. So, you know, as, as I'm walking around now, I, I, I certainly like am paying attention more and, you know, whether or not it has an, an effect on the way other people perceive me, I feel like it does. And that's yeah. probably the most important part. I feel better. Yeah. Yeah. I have a better, uh, a better representation of myself just absolutely just walking around rule number two treat yourself like someone you're responsible for helping I, I i've got some good news i um i made a i made a promise uh quite a few episodes ago which means quite a few weeks ago that i would go to the doctor and uh yeah Monday I went to the doctor and uh, my shoulder is still sore from the tetanus shot I got. But more importantly, if you don't know what tetanus is, and I don't mean like don't know what tetanus is, if you've never seen what tetanus does to you, g- Google it, search it, and whatever your whatever duck duck go the shit. I don't care. Uh, gonna and, have to edit that cuss word out. Go for it. And like you know your line of work. Um, uh, I'm sure a lot of it is like new fasteners and stuff, but like the second you grab, nope, nope there it is, rust. Yeah, rust. yep. That, I mean, that's the thing is like it's. I, I work with a lot of galvanized steel, and man, new or not, galvanized steel. If it's not if it's not stored and stored properly, handled properly, you've got to have circulation around galvanized steel, air circulation. Uh, if moisture sits on it, bro, like it's it's going to rust, and it does rust. We 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 have we so galvanized steel is typically a hot galvanized steel. Uh, there are cold galvanization compounds like a zinc, I think, compound that you can spray on the stuff to keep it from rusting. Even with that, man, galvanized steel will rust through. Um, it, it's all around you is the major point, right? And like. It doesn't take much to cut yourself on a, a something rusty, you know, a rusty piece of steel or something. I'm I 
I literally think it's been since I was a teenager that I actually went to the doctor for I'm I'm not <laughs> it's funny. Kinda. But not really, because no. like I'm being dead serious. Like I, I think the last time I went to the doctor for any kind of like shots or physical or anything was when I was getting ready to go to college, which was a terrible experience, by the way. Meaning like I failed out spectacularly. Don't think I'm some college educated guy. <laughs> I'm an, unfortunately not. Obviously, I can't even read. You guys have seen that. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the last time that uh I went to the doctor. I'm pretty sure other than stuff like I I broke my leg um like in my mid 20s. And even then I walked around on a broken leg for at least 3 days, maybe longer. I went to a wedding down in 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 uh southeast North Carolina, the very tip like somewhere in Brunswick County. And uh we stayed in a hotel that didn't have an elevator and we were on the top floor and I walked up and down those stairs and went to the wedding and all this. And my wife's like, you you're walking so slow, go faster. And then like later on I go to the doctor and yeah, my leg is freaking broken. I literally rather walk on a broken leg than go to the doctor. But listen, I went and, and surprise it wasn't bad, man. Like even, Despite all my tattoos and all that, like I don't even I hate needles. Uh had a bad experience when I was a kid getting blood drawn, got super sick, and like ever since then it's like, all right, well I don't want to do that again. Bro. Don't Easy look. Peasy. Don't, yeah, look. don't look. You don't even feel it. There's no excuse, man. And my biggest excuse, my biggest life lie, uh <laughs> which we're gonna get into. Uh, this evening was that, you know, I was basking in my blissful ignorance. I just knew something was wrong and I was just like going to ride it out for as long as I can. Not knowing, you know, like at least as long as I don't know, I don't have to worry about it. Well, guess what? That was worry. Basking in that blissful ignorance was literally me just worrying about, like, I'm going to find out something bad. So years, years, bro, over a decade of that. And I go to the doctor and what? All my numbers are good. Nothing's wrong with me. <laughs> bro, come on. Go to the doctor. Take care <laughs> yeah. of yourself. Yep. Rule number three. Make friends with people who want the best for you. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you doing this. That means a lot. You are the so, kind of person I want to be friends with. So, um, I actually, um, like this week we had, we had, um, I'm not going to get into the, the situation at work. Um, but one of the nurses was just in, in, an, um, a really bad situation with a, with a patient. Right. And, um, some things were done and said or whatever. And I wasn't at work that day. Um, I worked the next day and that's when I kind of found out about it. So I was like, man, I've been reading this book and I kind of want to do better and stuff like that. Like I just, I'm going to reach out to him and like, see if he needs anything. And, um, so like I'm like I messaged him on Facebook and this that, and the other and we like talked about it a little bit, but then I got to thinking about it and I was like, why why did I do that? Like it's like you know I try to be authentic, right? And then um, I got to thinking about it and that's exactly what I did. I pulled this book up and looked at the title chapters and I was like, make friends with people who want the best for you. And I was like, you know, it, like he's just like a work friend, but I obviously showed him that I kind of want the best for him. And like, yeah. I don't know. That's important, right? Like, it's important to to show that you genuinely care more than showing to to genuinely care and and try to help for other people. Right. But don't but don't lose sight of the fact of the the purpose of stating that rule, which is like, I mean, I'm gonna sound like a jerk, and maybe I'm not right in saying this, but I'm gonna say it anyways. Like, I don't. Focus on the people that are going to lift you up. You know, right. like the, 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 the reason why I want all of you here 
and so we can grow and become better, whatever that means. And so part of that is taking care of the people around you, like like what we just discussed here with this this work story. But don't lose sight on the fact. Don't don't become this martyr, you know, trying to take care of everybody around you. Like the 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 purpose of the rule is like to surround yourself. I'm gonna say it again. You are the average of the people you surround yourselves by. Period. That is one of the most true statements I've ever heard. Um, and you need to remember that. You know, like like if you aren't, it sucks, man. And I got a lot of friends that if they watch this, they're gonna go, "Well, was he just? What he just cut me out?" No, that's not necessarily what happened. Like this has been my journey into the desert, right? Like I chose to focus on, you know, growing and and making the most of this life. And unfortunately, I had to sacrifice a lot of social time to do that. So, friends, if you're watching that. This is not necessarily what that means. It's just a part of sacrifice. But the bottom line is, regardless of who you are watching this, you are the average of the company you keep, and you need to remember that. Help the people around you. But surround yourself by people you want to be like, people that, that encourage you and motivate you to move forward in this life. Rule number four. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday not who someone else is today. It's a good one. Pretty self-explanatory. I don't think we need to go into it that deep. No, I think I probably should have said what I said at this one instead, because usually I would have just like kind of let that go. Like, man, that sucks. Like, um, you know, that's just a sucky situation and just let it go at that. Just let it go without touching, you know, like at all. Instead, I took a second out of my life and, and, kind of and reached that, out that's it man and that's something that we talked about in in you know previous episodes as well Is like we're gonna keep growing right like we're gonna keep moving forward we're gonna keep climbing and in that it's gonna be easy to just kind of like slough off i don't think i think i just made up a word which you know what i'm trying to sloth. say sloth slough off slough slough you know what i'm trying to say yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, it's important to not forget about the human aspect of life, and 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 to understand that we are all in different chapters. We're not all necessarily on the same chapter, and sometimes in some of those chapters, those people need you to reach out. They need a hand. Rule number five. Hope you're doing well on this one. <laughs> I I can't I can't wait to actually put this rule into practice. Do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. It's good. It's, it's it's a you know all these rules are easier said than done. I I have the suspicion that that's an exceptionally hard one. Yes. <laughs> Full stop. Just yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, oh, man. I don't I don't really want to comment on it or anything. I'm looking at the ducks as I say this. But um yeah, today's the today is actually they were shipped to us today and my kids have had the hardest time understanding that you can't be around them all the time. They need to be able to sleep. <laughs> so it is it has been a fight all day long. But yeah. I'm yeah, just gonna keep a level head, and that's pretty cute. Oh my god, man! My friend, this friend of mine, Sean, sent me. So we, I was trying to get him to do something with me this weekend, and uh, he said he couldn't because he was taking uh, his friend's two-year-old to a museum this weekend. And he sent me this photo of this two-year-old little girl that is one of the cutest things in existence. And me being a 250-pound grizzly, like, I literally get called Grizzly Adams, construction worker, just melted. Just a puddle. Like, cutest freaking thing I've ever seen. I don't know, man. I'm, I'm getting pretty excited about my daughter getting here. If oh, you yeah. Can't tell. If you can't tell. Number six. Very important one. 
set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Another self-explanatory one, but one that myself included, so many people miss. Man, it's so easy to do. I, I, I think the bigger takeaway, because it is such a hard thing to kind of rein in for most people, I think, is focus on yourself. It goes back to the, the surrounding yourself by people that lift you up type rule. You know, focus on yourself, man. The world's going to do its thing. You know, you, you can fret over it. You can try to make the, a difference in the world, and you should. But instead of focusing on just being so critical about everything and watching the freaking news all the time and just becoming disgusted and part of this positive feedback loop, maybe, just maybe, focus on yourself first. Get that house right, son. Rule number seven. Pursue what is meaningful. What are you doing? You're here. That's a good start. You know. <laughs> that's what that's what we're about. So you're on this journey with us thus far. Um, so it's a good start. But you can't stop where you start. And rule number eight, which is today's rule. Tell the truth, or at least don't lie. That one is not so straightforward. It is, but it isn't. Like, there is so much to unpack from such a short statement, you know? So that's where we are today, folks. Um, that's it. Good night. We'll see you next week. <laughs> oh, man. All right, let's get into it. I uh, I don't even know what page uh, Chapter 8 starts on, Rule Number 8 starts on, but... Two or three. I, I can tell you my notes start on 205, I'm pretty sure. So I don't know if you have anything that you want to get into uh, before I, I get into my first note. Um, I'll start out by saying just a few things about this chapter, which is like, you know, I, I grew up in a home in which, you know, I might not have been encouraged to go to, uh, to, to go to theater classes. I, I did take a theater class or two. But I lived in a very theatrical home. And what I mean, mean by that is like. There were stories told. That literally became stories, you know, like. Just wild exaggerations, facts made up, you know, like. Uh, just all for the sake of capturing somebody's attention and. and for lack of a better term, entertaining them. But it's a very unhealthy way to entertain somebody. And it became, to an extent, a learned behavior that I was not necessarily aware of, you know, as a late teen, early adult. It was a very painful process coming to terms, coming to an understanding of what that actually was. You know, so I, I've, I've already been in this life work, if you will, of, of fighting back against the small lies, you know, and as we will discuss in these cha this chapter, like those small lies add up to big lies or like I've already referenced to once the life lie. Yeah. So I think, um, cause that's what I always do. I always like write one or two things down whenever I read the title. Right. And, um, that's kind of where I'm at. Cause even today I still, catch myself you know i'm in the midst of telling a story about like me and my dad or something like that and you know the fish i caught wasn't this big it was right that big you right. know kind of deals and and yep. just trying to be um like for me i think it's just trying to be a good a good by storyteller i don't mean like a liar. I mean, like a storyteller, as in sitting down and trying to get someone's a attention with with a story that I have. Yeah. Um, You've got their attention. They are literally paying you their attention, so you want to give them their money's worth. Right. Right. Um, but that was kind of the main thing I could think about. Because, um, like, in in you know my line of work, um, 
being a nurse and everything, um, if you screw up, it's easy to be like, point the blame somewhere else. Sure. But at the same time, and I'm sure it's it's um, probably so true the same amount of your work and stuff. Most of the time, if if a, if something gets messed up, it's better for everyone involved if you go ahead and tell the truth exactly what happened. Because a lot of times, it's not necessarily that I'm going to get reprimanded for it. A lot of times, it's um, let's look at policies and see what we can do so this doesn't happen again um, yeah it's really difficult to, though man because like from my experience in my industry there's typically hundreds of millions of dollars at stake at certain points like one that i'm experiencing right now is quite literally that 270 million dollar project on the line and we aren't committing a lie of commission but we are committing a lie of omission right now because and obviously like i could get fired over even saying that much right because i i I should probably edit this out (laughs) um but yeah i mean we don't want anybody else to know that's on the line right now so therefore We're not telling everybody that's on on the line. And it's I'm certainly not going to break break rank (laughs) and and spill the beans because I've been uh, literally directed not to. And do I have faith that the project will go through? Yeah. Yeah. I I have no doubt that this project will will go through and everything will be fine. But it, it does pose the question where we are literally on this chapter right now about not lying. Like, am I doing the right thing by quietly sitting by right now? So it's, uh, I think it's, I didn't mean to bring up that point, (laughs) Uh, but it's a great, great example of like the kind of things that you're going to have to work through in the real world. Like after reading these books, that's why it's important to reinforce it. That's why we're recording this right now to help reinforce it, you know, Oh man, I can't believe I even talked about that just now. We we'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, you listen, like what we were just talking about segues perfect into my notes. I, I I just want to get into it because you know what we were just talking about is you know struggling with not stretching the truth, right? And on page two hundred five, man, Peterson tells us something about himself that just utterly blows my mind. And you know he's he's such an honest guy, like he. he you can't help but believe him, you know, why would he, why would he, (laughs) why would he risk his reputation on something like this? Right. So listen to this. I soon divided myself into two parts, one that spoke and one more detached that paid attention and judged. I soon came to realize that almost everything I said was untrue. I had motives for saying these things. I wanted to win arguments and gain status and impress people and get what I wanted. I was using language to bend and twist the world into delivering what I thought was necessary. But I was fake. Realizing this, I started to practice only saying the things that the internal voice would not object to. I started practicing telling the truth or at least not lying. How, man, if I could do just just do that with the stupid things that come out of my mouth. The embarrassment I would save me and all the people around me. Like, um, that should be a book in itself. How how to do that? Yeah, how to um, not. Yeah, just don't tell. Just don't. What's the ending? What's the or at least don't lie. Just don't lie. Right. Um, I kind of started trying to do that actually when um, me and my wife started dating. Um, and it was honestly one of those things to where, you know, she'd put on an outfit and she'd be like, "How do I look in this?" Oh my god. 
That's so where that, you chose to not lie. <laughs> well, I mean that that's just one of the things to where you know, you know, I hadn't made this decision, and then and then um, you know, she came into my life, and then that that's where I'm like, I I need to explain something about myself to you first of all, that I'm never gonna lie to you. You know, like I'd do my do you best know not how to. Many- Husbands are just uncomfortable with what you're saying right now. And yeah, I don't care. Like, <laughs> um, I mean, the, 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 um, when through, <laughs> through the, the first part of the chapter, um, Peterson, and there, there's a couple other stories and stuff, but Peter talks about how he thought about what the truth was. And then said only that and then stopped talking. Yep. Kind of deal, right? So, like, that's kind of what you do is you just, like, look, I will never lie to you. But the shoes don't go with them pants. And, you know, like, whatever you need to say, just, you know, whatever. But, um. Which I, I hope that you've actually said that because that in itself would be so impressive. When my wife asked me, do these shoes go with this outfit? I literally don't know. I have no clue. That, that line, this is how my brain works. That line is, um, a Robin Williams line from the first Aladdin movie, the original animated. And that's just where my brain went. And so I said Ah. it, but, um, I don't, exactly remember what i said or anything but like i i remember from that point on because i kind of explained myself and i said it you know whatever it was that i said because i don't even remember what the outfit was now i just kind of remember the gist of the conversation sure um a whole lot more respect from her right that um you know i'm just gonna tell her so um, yeah, I guess you got a point. I do. I will I mean, tell. People, not everyone is as lucky as me, but um, yeah, just tell the truth. Yeah, I, I guess you have a point. There have been times in which, you know, I, I've told my wife that no, I'm not a huge fan of that one. So yeah, you got a point. But the rule of thumb is like, yeah, yeah. That that question is always like a, a test, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Guys, listen. The way you're sleeping in the doghouse. I mean, as uncomfortable as it, it's a great practice. Uh, hopefully, you don't end up divorced from it. Don't sue us if you end up getting divorced <laughs> because you were honest about how your wife looks. All right. Listen, we're trying just as hard as you are. Okay. But, you know, we've got a point here. You, you, you don't pick and choose. <laughs> On what to be honest with, as dangerous for your health as it may be. Oh boy, oh boy. Oh, uh, let's see. I had another one on two hundred five, I think. Um. That was oh yeah. Five. Well, I had one because like, uh, he then went in to talk about like this, um, paranoid patient. That he had uh, client, oh, yeah, and yeah. like, I'm all right. I don't know how to say this and it not be like taken out of context, but it kind of resonated with me. You know, I think there must be some kind of gradient in paranoia, right? Because like, I don't think the world's out to get me, you know, or anything like that. But I will tell you one thing: if you are lying to me, I might not call it out, but. I can guarantee you I know five out of six times. You know, I am ultra sensitive to body language. I'm ultra sensitive to story congruency. You know, like if you tell me a story once and then slip up and tell somebody beside me later on and those stories don't match... My old perspective of you just changed. You know, like, when that stuff happens, like, red flags go up big time. And me. I guarantee I'm wrong some of the times. 
in which Peterson defines that as paranoia. That's that's the dangerous side of being a person like that is you're not always right, bro. Sometimes you might just be utterly convinced a person's lying, but you're just a freaking idiot. <laughs> you know, it happens, man. Um, I don't know. There's no there's no ending to that. Bringing that up, you know, for me, like I just found it astounding that like, holy crap. Yeah, I guess I am a bit paranoid. <laughs> Oh, man, this book brings out the good and the bad, at least the perspective, which is Peterson's most valuable gift he gives us, is enlightening. You know, it's something to be aware of. Like, maybe I am being paranoid right now. Maybe I need to just chill TF out. All right. So my next note is page 209. Yeah, that's where I'm at. If you, all right, so we're not pumping the brakes. This is a great one. Um, so on page 209, Peterson's telling a story about uh, this landlord that he had. Which the story itself kind of paints a, a picture that I wouldn't necessarily expect. You know, I wouldn't expect Peterson to live in the home of a ex biker gang president like a felon's house this this former felon was his landlord and this it was like a big french canadian biker that now french canadian we like to drink a lot we can drink a lot like we can drink you under the table without question and this dude is no exception um like, and I assume he's not exaggerating. Peterson talks about these benders that this dude would go on in which, like, maybe he'd drink 50 or, or 60 beers in a two-day bender. Do the math on that, bro. Like, 30 beers a day? I don't care uh, what you're drinking. 30 beers a day, man? <laughs> Holy uh, crap. When I When I was living in Wilmington, I came home. Um, it was like six, seven o'clock and, um, my roommate had basically chugged a beer every hour since 12 o'clock. So we're going on six, seven o'clock. He's seven beers in inebriated, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So he he's drinking more than one an hour, right? The easy way to think about it. That's a that's a good way to put it for sure. And that that is a pace that I can definitely sustain for several hours. But then I hit a wall so hard, like holy crap, and then the hangover the next day, it's just unbearable. Listen, this dude's a violent man that we're talking about here. This landlord, Peterson's landlord, like he, he states that in the book. So I, I suspect he's got some context. I can't give you the context mainly because I don't remember it. Um, but this, 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 this landlord would drink himself out of money basically. And what he would do is he would just become hammered and he would just find random items in his house. Like for instance, his microwave and he would bring it over to Peterson's house. Uh, you know, in which Peterson has a wife, you know, I assume he had kids at that point. And all of a sudden you've got this big burly biker showing up at your door at like two in the morning, holding a microwave, expecting you to exchange your money for his used microwave. And so apparently Peterson like obliged up to a certain point in which his wife was like, nah, stop. I like that guy. He's a likable dude. He's hurting himself. And he makes me really uncomfortable, to paraphrase what she said. And so, the next time the dude comes over, Peterson levels with him. Bro, stop. Please. Thanks. You know. And, uh, you know, at, at the end of that story, Peterson, on page 209, says a statement that, you know, puts the punctuation on that story. It's something I really like. And I'll, I'll, I'll also say, man, like, There are so many quotes in this chapter that I want to put on T-shirts. It's ridiculous. This is one of them. Taking the easy way out 
or telling the truth. Those are not merely two different choices. They are different pathways through life. They are utterly different ways of existing. Remember that. Oh God, so good! It's so good, man. Do you have anything else on uh, on that? Because there is more stuff to unpack on two hundred nine. Um, no, just continuing on with two hundred nine. I have that next part kind of underlined. Um, kind of talk. It, we're starting another subchapter here. It's called manipulate the world. Um, you can, yep. and I don't have a whole lot actually underlined. I'm just going to kind of hit the points. The, the first line that I have, you can use words to manipulate the world into delivering what you want. This is what it means to act politically. Mm-hmm. Like I just have that underline. And, yeah. And I just like, that was it. That was all. Um, it's the speech people engage in when they attempt to influence and manipulate others. It's what university students do when they write an essay to please the professor instead of articulating and clarifying their own ideas. It's what everyone does when they want something and decide to falsify themselves to please and flatter. It's scheming and sloganeering and propaganda. I I, I don't want to be like that. So, like, you know, like that's a part of this chapter for me was me underlining basically things that I want to be right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I actually like had to pull back on all the notes I was taking about myself uh, in this chapter and try to become a little bit more objective instead of subjective. You know, like there was so much about myself in this chapter that, you know, if I were to take every single note for this episode, we would be sitting here freaking four hours later. You yeah. Know? Um, it, it's it's an incredible chapter. On 209 into 210, like basically what you were just getting at um, is the predecessor to the life lie, right? Um, and so Peterson continues into you know, page 210 with, with something that, you know, I narrowly avoided uh, quite literally because I just was so lazy <laughs> and just kind of epically failed because of that. Um, you know, growing up as a, a, a young kid, you know, well, let me, let me start over. I, I grew up in a very musical household, right? Like, we always had some kind of music playing. I was encouraged to play instruments. You know, uh, we would watch documentaries on, you know, our favorite artists. We would, we would, you know, watch live concerts on TV, TV or like buy VHSs and then DVDs. And my parents took me to a lot of concerts, you know, at a very young age, like for instance, um, I think it was 94, the Eagles did the Hell Freezes Over tour. And so my parents took me to that show. And like after that, I would I would I, I would have very vivid dreams of me, I guess as an adult, playing <laughs> these shows on a stage very similar uh to the stage that was uh the hell freezes over stage, uh, which was a massive light. And I think even lasers back then, uh, show. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is like by my late teens, early twenties, uh, I was just convinced I had to be this professional musician, you know, and I had no clue what it took to become a successful musician. Right what it took, let alone what the life actually meant to be a professional musician. To me, it was like this permanent vacation. You know, I had this this mental image of like, you know, playing music, which is fun. You know, playing shows is a lot of fun, can be. And then pretty much, you know, chilling after that. And that, that would be my life. And I would make a 
boatload of money and I'd do what I want and I'd play some music and I'd make a lot of money and I'd go do what I want some more. Page 210, okay? A naively formulated goal transmutes with time into a sinister form of the lifeline. Here we go. We're getting into the lifeline now. He starts to unpack it for us here. A 40-something client told me his vision formulated by his younger self. I see myself retired, sitting on a tropical beach, drinking margaritas in the sunshine. That's not a plan. That's a travel poster. After eight margaritas, you're only fit to await a hangover. After three weeks of margarita-filled days, if you have any sense, you're bored stiff and dis- and self-disgusted. In a year or less, you're pathetic. It's just not a su- sustainable approach to life. How many people have this just dream, this vision of their life somehow becoming this alcohol-induced freaking just... I I shouldn't even frame it up that way. In their mind, like, they're just sipping on, you know, cocktails, chilling on the beach, and life is grand. That's what life's all about. That's what humans should be doing. That is their vision. And it's so unhealthy, man. It's typically coupled with the idea that life has wronged them, deprived them of their cocktail beach. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I think um i think that's one of the things too you know um if you think that your old self just wants to be on vacation you know like 24 7 um of course just just kind of thinking about you know what he's what he's talking about here but there's even um there's old men that I know when they um in the morning they get up and and they go get their coffee and they get their breakfast at the place that they always do and then um the 701 service center um my dad's <laughs> restaurant <laughs> yeah sure sure and um as they're leave, leaving they're like all right I'm going to work and um my dad knows what what he means but I'll be like dad dad that man's like 85 years old. Where, where does he work at? And he's like, oh, uh, he's going to go play golf. <laughs> like, like golf is his work now because he understands that, you know, he, he's 85. He has to stay active in some way or another. Yep. You know, and so that's, yeah, sure. It's, it's not, um, you know, he's, 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 he's done his dues. Right. So yep. yeah, like, um, and he he does other things. He's not just drinking, right? Like I, right, right. I don't know, um, because that's that's what I was thinking about. Is like, what what do I see myself when I'm when I'm eighty years old? And um, it's actually funny. My dad's uncle um drove up to the house today while I was washing dishes, and I like ran out there, and the man is still farming. He he's he's doing about three acres now, um, and like that's enough for him because he knows what he's doing, right? Um, but he he just has like three acres, and he he plants peanuts, and he sells them, and that's like his little bit. Um, and then it's just as much time as he can spend with his grandchildren, um, and fishing. Like that's basically that's basically his life, and I was thinking about it, I was like, man, uh, like even I hate going on vacation. Vacation's stressful. I, I don't like it. I try to like have a home to where if I like want to feel like, hey, let's go take a vacation. I can walk out on the pier and feed the fish. That's like 15 minutes of me having some peace and quiet, like, like enjoying time with me and my kids. Like that's, that's enough for me, but I don't know. I, 
I uh, yeah, I I kind of that that does resonate with me a little bit like where I live. I I I am living my own personal uh permanent vacation to an extent. I do you do scare me a little bit with the vacation is stressful thing. Travel is stressful. Vacation itself is not. Right. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll put it there. Yeah. Um and even further still, like, I still have this this vision of permanent vacation, you know, for my life. Like, that is not gone. But let me clarify with real-world examples. When I go on vacation, and I'm not saying this is healthy, but I have such a... I become reinvigorated, you know. I, I have this new drive to, like, get to work. And, and typically it's in the form of research or, or something like that. So I don't know, man, like I do have a vision and it does include a permanent vacation, but that permanent vac- vacation includes a lot of gratifying work. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think, um, I think the main difference is like, no matter what, um, I think mine and your goal is to never stop, right? Right, right. Like, th- like that's what the the living on a beach drinking margaritas is. That's stopping. Yep. I, I never want to stop. Yep. Um. Oh, please, please let me read this note because, like, I'm I'm staring at it right now and what you're talking about. I'm sorry to cut you off, King of Cutoff. Um. <laughs> so. <laughs> Page two or uh, two twelve hits on exactly what you were just talking about. However, researchers have recently discovered that new genes in the central nervous system turn themselves on when an organ organism is placed or places itself in a new situation. These gene codes for Oh, these genes code for new proteins. Man, I had done okay this evening, but I'm starting to fall apart. <laughs> Let me try that one again. <laughs> these genes code for new proteins. These proteins are the building blocks for new structures in the brain. This means that a lot of you is still nascent and the most physical. Oh, man, my talk to text messed it up. And the most physical of what? Senses. Senses, not absences. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, this means that a lot of you is still nascent in the most physical uh, of instances and uh, will not be called forth by uh, stasis. So, you know, that goes, and Zach, feel free to cut me back off in, in retaliation here, uh, but that goes... Uh, that goes into exactly uh, what you were just saying. Um, yeah, I just I just totally messed myself up by something I just said. I'm sorry. I just totally threw myself off track. I got you. Um, Get us back on track, man. I, I kind of um, dazed out trying to fix my mic while you were reading that. Did you stop <laughs> at stasis? Yeah. And will not be called forth by stasis? Yeah. You have to say something go somewhere and do things to get turned on. And if not, you remain incomplete. And life is too hard for anyone incomplete. Like that's the rest of that sentence. You have to say something, go somewhere and do things to get turned on. Like that, that that's the thing. Um, you can't, you know, you always have to be learning something like that, that. That's what it means to me. I'm sure it means something different for other people. But I mean, um, surfing is learning how to do something. You know what yep. I mean? Yep. Um, I, I do want to expound on that because like, yes, I to me, the biggest thing is learning. Right. Like. I think that's the most important part of like. Late stage life care is preparing for that now, you know, by starting this process of continuously learning something new. Because as you get into the later years, your 60s, 70s, 80s, like, 
your brain function is going to be so much higher if you're already geared to to keep the juices flowing, if you will. But the part I really wanted to expand upon is, you know, the other parts of that, experiencing new things. Travel is a good thing, man. Um, it might not be fun getting there, but I, I do think it's important to get out there and see other parts of the world, see different cultures, see how good we have it here. Uh, oh, in yeah, some definitely. Uh, I mean, I, never in a million years will I turn down a chance to go somewhere. But I, I guess this is actually kind of one of the lies that I tell myself um, that I can't afford it. Ooh, yeah, because yeah. it's I, 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 I don't. But I feel like I live paycheck to paycheck, you know. Sure. And I have PTO build up. And, you know, PTO, 12 hours of PTO doesn't pay the same as 12 hours of being on the job. Yep. Um, there's about a, a 200 to $300 difference there that would get paid. Mm. And I would just feel like I'm missing that. And I feel like I'm taking money away from, you know, the family. But, like, at the same time... um. We do um, what I would say like mini vacations. Like I get three days off. Um, we head up to like the state capitol and go to some of the museums and and um, some of the, the the kid activities that they had up there that that we definitely don't down here, have down here in in um, the the middle of the swamp. But you know, um, so, so like we do things. And I, I shouldn't have said what I said. I felt like, um, um, <laughs> sorry, some popped up on my screen, but um, um, yeah, never under it. Like, like if you have a chance to go somewhere, just go do it. I can't hear you. I don't know if it's me or if it's you. It's me. So okay, I went on mute go. so I could burp, and then I forgot to go off of mute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm doing a great job this evening. I'm sorry, man. I derailed us completely. Listen, I didn't misunderstand what you were saying a minute ago about the travel thing. Yeah, but like, other people could like, like take it, take it the wrong way. I'm not yeah. saying, yeah. No, I mean, the, yeah. the, the the big thing is, like, we live somewhere. We both live somewhere where it's just so easy to, you know, enjoy where we live. And another thing about, you know, taking vacations as far as, like, you know, feeling like I can't afford to take this vacation is it's not necessarily that you can't afford to take it, right? It's that the value that that trip would add to your life is less than other places that you could see uh, where you could put that same money, you know, like you could go on this trip or I could build this addition, <laughs> you know, I could go on this trip or I could buy, you know, something for the house, you know? Right. Right. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to get caught up on this too, too awful much because we got a lot to go through. Um, but this is where my my brain's going, and I'm actually looking to see if I wrote down what page it was. But um, later on in the chapter, um, Peterson, I actually think he's kind of talking about himself. And if if I'm I'm gonna kind of give the um, the thought process of what he's talking about and if you have it highlighted just let me know um, okay. but there's a time when he starts talking about um maybe your parents want you to go be an engineer mm. and you, you go you do you have no nah, I, li I know exactly where you're talking about and i literally did that that was one of the things i was talking about that i didn't take note on because it it resonated so so well with me that I almost felt like it was kind of pointless to c discuss here. Like basically what he was saying is like this, this, this kid, he was given an example of a kid that went to engineering school because the parents wanted him to go to engineering school. I went, 
I didn't go very far. It's ironic that I brought up going to college at the beginning of, of this episode. I, I was, I was on a path to become a Dodger. You know, that, that was, I had a full ride to a, a decent local university. Um, that was known as a party school, but it also had a good medical school there. And so, you know, where we grew up, man, just about the only thing that I knew of that made money was the medical field uh, right. in the area that we grew up in. And so who makes the most money? Well, in the county we grew up in, doctors. You know, there's certain other fields that that make a little bit better than than what Dodgers made. But in, in my purview, it was Dodgers. So that's what I'm going to do, you know, and it wasn't because of me. You know, I I was going to school because of, you know, wanting to make my family happy. And just like he describes in that that section. I eventually came to the conclusion that, wait, this is not for me. Well, first I floundered, right? Like just utterly and epically. I think I covered this in other episodes. I had a GPA so bad that it, it, you have to about try to get a GPA that bad. I'm pretty sure by the end of my first semester, I had a 1.7. Ooh. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. I went, ironically... And I'm glad I didn't say the name of the school. I hope I didn't in the other episode. Ironically, I went to one of the classes I passed was my health class. I went to the first class. And I went to the last class. And I passed it. <laughs> so, I mean, I kind of did the same thing when I went to a four year university. Um Except I realized I was failing a couple of classes and then dropped them, you know, before, you know. So, yeah, you're right. Like 1.7, you have to like really try for that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. was not I was not declaring that I was dropping out of anything. I didn't even like let the school know I was leaving. I just left and like, yeah, just, at least let them know. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> I just rolled out one day and never went back. Um, I, I want to kind of get back. Okay. To um, so imagine you go to engineering school because that is what your parents desire, but is not what you want. All right, so this is on two twenty five, um, and then I'm going to skip the rest of this paragraph, okay? Because it, it's going to make sense because it's not what you desire. One day you have had enough. You drop out. You disappoint your parents. You learn to live with that. You consult only yourself. Even though that means you must rely on your own decisions, you take a philosophy degree. You accept the burden of your own mistakes. You become your own person. By rejecting your father's vision, you develop your own. And then, as your parents age, you've become adult enough to be there for them when they come to need you. They win too, but both victories had to be purchased at the cost of conflict in gendered by your truth and i don't know why talking about vacations and always always learning always growing or whatever made me think about um me doing my best now and um i was I've been talking to dad about be, building a um a little like swing set and stuff for the kids we've been talking about it for like two weeks now and so like that's one of the things he's not a carpenter at all um but like me and you've had this conversation some learning how to woodwork and stuff like that and basic things basic join jointry yep. jo joining woods together in a way that it's you know structurally sound and stuff like that so like i'm honestly about to do this kind of with my dad that's great that's great um, you said something that just made me utterly cringe in that quote i want to cover real quick um mm -hmm. listen i assume if you're going to college or plan on going to college in the future 
this is an assumption that you're going to school for a career. If that's the case, and you feel compelled to get a philosophy degree, do that after you go to trade school so you can support yourself and your family. Don't get the philosophy degree first. For the love of God. Thank you. <laughs> well, see, it's it's funny because as I was reading this, whenever he said um, philosophy degree, I was like, is this what? And I have no idea. I have no idea whatsoever. I was just like, is this... Is this Jordan Peterson's life? Did he, did his parents want him to go be an engineer? And hey. He dropped out of that to go be philosopher. You might but be anyway. on to something. And don't get me um, wrong. Philosophy is very, very important. That's why we even have this book, right? I just don't. That is a passion. Really hard right? to support. Yeah. Yeah. It's a passion. Um, and it's something that you should educate yourself in. Don't misunderstand that. I think you should pursue your philosophy degree if that's what you want. Get your house in order, is all I'm saying. I think um we we've we've dipped our toe into Jordan Peterson's life with this and, and you can kind of see it with with a lot of people who kind of go after some of the the um oddball kind of degrees. Um one of the colleges that I went to, all every one of my science teachers, every every science teacher that I had, and this was a community college, so yes, there were teachers, um, some were professors, but whatever. But every one of them was a marine biologist. Hmm. So that's was their passion, marine biology, right? But to pay the bills, they taught at a community college. So that's what you have to think about. How can what can I do to pay the bills? Yep, yep. And you know, hopefully they they had a passion for for educating as well. You know, and, and so hopefully it worked out. And maybe I'm I'm being a bit of a, a jerk by telling you to not get your philosophy degree first. I am more so uh, being a little selfish in that moment because I want you to go to trade school. You know why? Because we need you to go to trade school, and um. It's not bad, man. Like growing up, I had like this buddy of mine and I were talking yesterday about how like when we would see somebody in a high vest shirt or vest, uh, we just automatically assumed they were an idiot, you know, uneducated, didn't care, just failed at life, and they so they settled on construction work. And I promise you, that's not the case. I work with probably some of the, you know, some of the smartest people I've had the privilege of of getting to know all work in the construction industry, like just freakishly smart. They're all, I shouldn't say all, a lot of them are neurodivergent, uh, which didn't know what that word mean, meant until a little while. I didn't know that word existed. It's a pretty self-explanatory word, but I didn't know what that existed until too long ago. But yeah, Google it. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, and that that is what the construction industry is, but it's a great, you know, great set of people to work around. And really, especially like those of you, I mean, you're you're watching the Country Boy Book Club right now, or you're listening to the Country Boy Book Club right now. Like, odds are you like being outside, bro. I love what I do. One of my favorite things is where I get to work. <laughs> like we could have chose any book and we chose the least country the <laughs> least boy oh man the most book and the least club out of our name to like pick to start with like <laughs> but we also chose probably one of the most important books to start with i feel like it's really important yeah yeah um, it, it's a good base layer i want to pull us way back man i've got a good one on page 213 I want to go to 211 real quick. All right. Take us even further back. Um, Fine. And we did. Did you go over the and, and when you might have just went over it 
Um, did you go over the sin of commission and the sin of omission? I did not. I did not. I bypassed that one. So just really, really quick. I'm just going to read it. Okay. Um, there is another fundamental problem, too, with the life fly, particularly when it's based on avoidance. A sin of commission occurs when you do something you know to be wrong. A sin of omission occurs when you let something bad happen when you could do something to stop it. The former is regarded classically as a more serious than the latter, than avoidance. I'm not so sure. This is important to me because the sin of omission, um, I mean, that's how Hitler came to power. Mm. You know, yeah. um, you see something that you know to be wrong, but you don't speak out about it. Yep. You know, the, those little things here and there and here and there. Um, and he quickly, well, I'm going to quickly kind of go over kind of, um, Jordan Peterson gives an example of, um, and I don't think it's right here, but it, it's whatever. Um, you, you're at a job, right? And, um, you're, you have a new boss or whatever, and they want to like prove that they're top dog. So they enact a, a rule that demeans your work that makes your work a little less joyful sure. but you let it slide you know you don't speak up about it yep two three weeks later month later or however long um but he all of a sudden makes another lie or not another lie but another law that demeans you more makes your life less joyful well at what point are you going to stand up for yourself instead of letting this this sin of omission? You see something wrong, right? You know it to be wrong, but you won't even stand up for yourself about it, kind of deal. But that that kind of happens all the time. Um, it's a, a, I mean, you know, the the obvious example is always you know seeing seeing a bully, and well, he's not bullying me; he's bullying someone else, kind of deal. Um, but as as an adult, stuff like that, um, I don't know. Yeah, and he he, Peterson went on to like, you know, give a hypothetical situation in which the company's going under, basically, the same oppressive company. And he says that like the troublemakers will be the ones to go first. And what I immediately thought about that was like. Well, those are probably the same people that were <laughs> standing up and saying, I don't like this new rule. <laughs> you know? Right. And, um, and he's he's true about that. But you, you also have to understand that at some point he talks about um, um, if um, you're continuously living a lie and you decide, you know, to stand up against that, you know, there's there's small things you can do and then there's big things that you can do. Big things are when you when the whole system is corrupt, um, a revolution. You never want to go through a revolution if you don't have to because it brings a lot of chaos into your life. But sometimes your job sucks so bad and there's no winning that the best thing for you is to go find a new job. That's a new revolution in your life. I'm going to do my best to um, not repeat that, but that is discussed later in the book. <laughs> and I... Um, Highly likely that I will say the exact same thing over again here in a little bit. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to try not to, though. I got you. Um, yeah, that's... uh. In, well, l l let me let me say one more thing, because, like, the troublemaker part was immediately followed by those that were in invisible. You know, like, we know whether or not those people that stood up for themselves and not liking that new rule got cut first. Guess what? The invisible go next. And if you're sitting there silent, if you're hiding in the shadows, you're invisible. You are not necessary. You will get cut. Yeah, and he says, um, so really, really quick, that the whenever I think of troublemakers, I think of people um who not showing opinion, up to work. Well, I think of people that and also think of people who are um too loud for their own good. There's a difference between um, 
going and sitting down with your boss and being like, hey, I just kind of want to point this out. You know, you, you place this rule and, you know, I trying to understand where you come from with that and having a serious conversation with someone about it. And then your troublemakers would be the one that, you know, in the locker room is um, locker room at the lunch table, whatever um, is talking the drama, talking all the crap and everything and not going directly to, I think that's part of, of being truthful. Um, sure. Telling people how you feel, but doing it in an, in a mature and intellectual manner. Sure. Um, we, we kind of had that happen at our work. Um, a couple, well, but it was right before COVID. Um, where we sat down and there was like, like eight or nine of us nurses who sat down with the DON and talked about a couple of things that was happening that we didn't quite understand. And we got a lot of clarification on it. Um, but, you know, instead of like, what's the word? Um, no drama, but whatever, talking about, talking about it behind the person's back, whatever, Gossip. you know, yeah. Gossiping. Instead of gossiping about it, we went, straight to the source and was just like hey um we're kind of worried about this particular thing that's going on what what is the future here mm -hmm. um and she was very appreciative that that we that we decided to go and just talk to her sure um so yeah i know you're trying to take us away from the subject a second ago and that's fair because we are way into this thing number one because I don't know if it made it into the cut or not. So I'm going to restate it in the event that it didn't. But that squeaking that you hear in the back. We got some ducks. We got some ducks. But look at all those chickens. All right. <laughs> I'll make sure I'll take, take a picture. And yeah, send yeah. to you. But yeah, yeah I got, I got um, 15 baby ducks that are maybe... I think they were born on Monday. Mm. Isn't that crazy? Born on Monday, shipped not directly to my house. We had to pick them up at the post office because they're live animals. Mm -hmm. But um, born on Monday, shipped out and alive, arrive alive to your house on a Wednesday. That's pretty remarkable. Yeah. Um. So before we went to 225, I think it was, uh, I just finished up a note on, you know, the continuous learning, right, on 212. My next note is on page 213. And and this note that I took here is it's almost like the payoff for the end of the chapter, but it's about 17 pages before the end of the chapter. Um, Nonetheless, it's a, it's a great one. Uh, I think it's a... You know, if you aren't looking at life in this way, I, 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 I certainly think you should. Um, it might sound bad, but you, think about life as a game, right? Like we play all these games uh, because they they imitate life. You know, in a sense, it should be preparing you to better address the real game that is life page 213 um if you make a move that isn't helping you win then by definition it's a bad move you need to try something different you do remember um i think my talk to text made it, messed us up again uh you, you do remember the old joke uh and Sandy is doing the same thing. Oh, oh, it's the Russian joke, right? He said something like that. I'm sorry, folks. My, I do talk to text to take my notes, and it messes up inevitably. I guess it's my southern accent or something. No, this isn't the Russian one. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, this is just the old joke. Um, and Sandy is doing the same thing over and over again uh, while expecting different results. If you're lucky and you fail and you try something new, uh, you move ahead. If that doesn't work, you try something different again. A minor modification will su suffice in fortunate circumstances. It is therefore prudent to begin with small changes and see if that helps. Sometimes, however, the entire hierarchy of values is faulty, and the whole edifice uh, has to be in, in, uh, abandoned. 
Uh, the whole game must be changed. And there it is. This is the one that we went over earlier. Uh, that is a revolution uh, with all the chaos and terror of a revolution. It's not something to be engaged in lightly, but sometimes necessary. Uh, error necess- uh, necess- necess- oh boy. necessitates <laughs> uh, sacrifice to correct it. And uh, uh, serious error necessitates uh, serious uh, sacrifice. Uh, to accept truth means to uh, sacrifice. And if you have rejected the truth for a long time, then you've run up a dangerously large sacrificial debt. Forest fires burn out dead wood and return trapped elements into the soul. Sometimes, however, fires are suppressed artificially. That does not stop the dead wood from accumulating. Sooner than later, a fire will start. When it does, it will burn so hot that everything will be destroyed, even even the soil, which I struggle to say soil and not soul, in which the forest grows. That's a big one. I, 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 I shouldn't have been joking right there. I want to read that one again. Sooner than later, a fire will start. When it does, it will burn so hot that everything will be destroyed, even the soil that in which the forest grows. I'm just going to sit in silence. I'm just going to let that one sink in. That's a good one, man. That's a good one. It's... I remember um, one of the the firefighters that um, actually one of my dad's best friends back in the day. Um, I forgot where it was. Um, but he got caught off and went out of state to help. Um, fight a forest fire, a raging one. I don't remember which one it was or anything. But he said that when he got back, he said, um, he said that was one of the worst fires. He said when when you, like, so this is kind of getting into your life. You the 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 forest is your life, right? Um, he said that, um, you couldn't even walk out anywhere near anything. Um, he said that w- there was 20 feet of, of the, the ground was peat moss mm. and the, the peat moss was on fire. He said they, they wouldn't, the guys, the, the veterans that lived in that area knew what was going on, knew that at this point there was nothing that could be done and like, wouldn't even let was like telling people don't go out there because what's going to happen is you're you're going to be walking along and all of a sudden you're going to fall through this peat moss that's been on fire and you're going to be surrounded by fire and there's no way to get you out Mm. um i mean that's just life and that that's kind of what i think he's he's getting at here is um you know your um that that balance back from chapter one chapter two whatever with your order and chaos Right. Um, If you constantly seek order by, I won't even say that. Um, I won't say if you constantly seek order, if you constantly seek chaos, I'm just going to say that if you continue to tell lies, because that's what the chapter is about, right? Mm -hmm. You can continuously tell lies. um, eventually because you know that's how a lie starts you tell a little lie and he gets into this you tell a little lie and you have to keep telling lies to yeah. build on that small lie and you know the, the, the smallest lie but that's what it is and it's it's as far as fires and eventually you get into um eventually you get to where you you can no longer save the forest because everything the soil that the forest grows in is burnt up yep Nothing can grow there. Nothing can be produced. Yep. Yep. Um, I'm not entirely sure where it's at. I think it's actually towards the end. But there's a thing that he says, um, 224. I'm not going to turn to it. I'm just going to kind of paraphrase. Um, oh, I've got it. I bet I got yeah. it. He 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 starts talking about um. Um, your ambitions and what, oh, what, your, yes. what your ambitions should should point you towards. Your ambitions help 
develop your character. Yep. And then the next line that he says is status can be lost. And that that's one of the things. An easy way to get status is to tell lies. Right? Yeah, I do have a philosophy degree. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I have. I, I, you kind of hear from the, on the news every now and then. You hear about someone who went and and bought a, a medical, or not a medical, but a doctorate degree, mm. and they've been trying to do, you know, it's not a medical license doctorate, but then they try to use that in that way to like increase their status in life. Right. Status is fleeting. Status can be taken away from you, like that. Yeah. But your character, do you do you strive for every day to be that? No one can take that away from you. That That's, on, sorry, King, no, go ahead. on go ahead, two twenty four and, and like there is so many notes that we've skipped over, but there is uh, yet again another one of those t shirt quotes that I absolutely absolutely love. Oh my god! And like there's so many friends I want to read this quote to and just watch the reaction. Listen to this one. All people serve their ambition. <laughs> In that matter, there are no atheists. There are only people who know and don't know what God they serve. Wow. Man, what? (laughs) That is such a good quote, man. How, oh, man. Oh, man. Can you imagine just some of the pretentious atheists? Because I was one, I'm telling you. Uh, highly pretentious atheist. Can you imagine the gears just seizing up, the smoke coming out of their ears, just like trying to either compute that statement or just totally shutting it down from even rattling around in their head in the first place? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, that's just one of the things. If, 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 God is so much more than just a being that's that's you know in heaven. Um, I think that's a hard concept for people to sure. rattle their mind around, but it is. It's it, it's who you serve. It, it it almost goes hand in hand with like the fundamentalist view, in which like this this God sits on a cloud in the sky type mentality, and then what they're not understanding is God is literally everything. You know, God is the words coming out of the atheist mouth denouncing God. Like, in the craziest sense, that is God. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whoa. We need to pump the brakes on that because we will be here all night just going down that rabbit hole. Um, I don't even know if I want to go back, man. I do. I do want to go back in the pages. Um I, I, I don't even think it would hurt to just kind of skim over some of these because, I mean, we're way into time here and there is just so much like I'm on 118 uh, or 218 and this this book goes to page 230, at least my book does. So uh, on 218, there is a, a great quote that kind of goes hand in hand with what we were just talking about. Um, he says... Uh, what is going to save you? And I, I'm and I'm sorry I didn't write down the context to this. So you're gonna have to get the book and read it. Um, <laughs> what is going to save you? The totalitarian says, in essence, you must rely on faith and what you already know. But that's not what saves. What saves is the willingness to learn from what you don't know. And we're glad you're here to learn with us. Um, so I, I don't know if you've got anything else between 218 and 221, but I've got one for 221. I think you're missing a big one on 218. Go for it. That I'm going to say, because he says it twice. Um, Let's hear it. It is the greatest temptation of the rational faculty mm-hmm to glorify its own capacity Oof. and its own productions and to Oof. claim that in the face of its theories, nothing transcendent or outside its domain need exist. 
Yeah, that's gonna... that's a hard one to like. I had to read it like four or five times in order to understand it. But um, yeah, two eighteen. Get the book, read that part, and um, find out what he's talking about next. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that uh that statement kind of hits me in the gut a little bit because like when I produce something, when I make something, like I'm just so like stoked on it. Like I will just stare at the thing that I made, or if it's a, like a, a song that I wrote, I will just listen to that song over and over again, just to you know appreciating that I was able to do that thing, you know. But nonetheless, part of that quote, probably part of the reason why I didn't take too many notes on it, is it hurt my feelings a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so it's um, this quote I feel like goes really really well into the story of the Egyptian gods. Mm. Did yep. you have notes on that? Okay. I do. Page two twenty two. Um, not many notes. I, I I did. Yeah, I wrote down some notes. Um, yeah, we can go into that. I do want to go back to two twenty one. I think there's a very important takeaway on two twenty one. But l- let's talk about page two twenty two. Um, okay. I think we. I think we've covered. Did we cover? We might have talked about uh, Horus and Osiris. In the previous chapters, we definitely covered it. I don't right, remember how much we talked about it. I think, it was, I so think just, that was rule number seven. I, I don't remember. Um, but just to kind of briefly sum up kind of what happens is you have um, you have three gods in, in Egypt. There's more. No, but, there's a lot. Um, yeah. You have Osiris, who's kind of the father. Um, and then you have Set, who was his brother, who was evil. Yep. And then you have Horus which is Osiris's son. Yep. Um, Osiris rec- um, represents tradition, okay? So Osiris represents tradition. He's living as traditionally as he can and everything, and he's good. Yep. Well, Set overthrows him, um, basically divides him into a hundred pieces and spreads him across the land, so it's almost impossible for him to to come back together. Um, and then Horus, wait, even further still, spread his body all over the land and basically sent his soul, oh yeah, to hell, and and then said, yeah. Um, so Horus is, um, the Horus is the son of Osiris, and he goes and basically fights Set and reclaims everything but not without um set ripping one of his eyes out and so horus is the the falcon god right. in which it has like just impeccable sight horus was able to essentially see into the future his sight was so good and and part of what peterson points out here is like even a god with that type of sight can have his own vision damaged right um so yeah go ahead man um and i really think horse was the god of attention that this Mm -hmm. this is the important part because he paid attention horse could perceive perceive and triumph against the evils of set his uncle albeit at great cost when Horus confronts Set, they have a terrible battle. Before Set's defeat and banishment from the kingdom, he tears out one of his nephew's eyes, but the eventual victorious Horus takes back the eye. Then he does something truly ex- unexpected. He journeys voluntarily to the underworld and gives the eye to his father. Yep. So now we're talking about why is this? Because tradition is important. It's, we've talked about it before. It's kind of what keeps us functioning as a society. Sure. Um, but then that attention to detail. The people who set those traditions aren't around anymore. And this yeah. this is me paraphrasing. Oh, Peterson's you're doing work. such a great job of it, um, man. They, they're not here anymore to know if those traditions that they started are still working. Yep. So so that's our job. Yep. Attention to detail, the ability to see what is before our eyes 
and learn from it, even if it seems ho- horrible. Even if the horror of seeing it damages our consciousness and half blinds us, the act of seeing it particularly important when it challenges what we know and rely on upsetting and destabilizing us. It is the act of seeing that informs the individual and updates the state. It was for this reason that Nietzsche, Nietzsche I can never say his name, right, uh, said that a man's worth was be- determined by how much truth he could tolerate. Mm. Yeah. That one caused some self-reflection for me, for sure. Like, how much truth can I tolerate? I think I have some growing to go on that one, man. There are some truths that just kind of knock me off my feet sometimes, you know? Uh, there, the, the Horace thing, man, there was one that really stuck out to me. And it's about family, you know, and I guess, you know, part of it is you need to focus on yourself before you worry about others but family is pretty much yourself right and so a quote from 222 that i wrote down is the attentive son can restore the vision of his father what horace did is he went into hell to his father carrying his own eye and gave it to his father and so like like what we were just discussing here like it's part. It, 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 it's our responsibility to correct the course when the course is wrong. It's our responsibility to look out for our family, and when our family is doing something destructive to themselves, and we can see that, are you going to commit a sin of omission? You know, and I have a f- fantastic family. I love very much, but there are certainly things that we can all improve upon, you know, Uh, and yeah, I I have sat idly by for decades. What am I doing? I'm committing a sin of omission, man. I'm not doing something about it. And it's not going to be fun conversations, (laughs) you know, and that's why those conversations haven't happened ultimately, you know. Ah, but nonetheless, it's got to happen. Listen, we are getting way into time here, and there's a lot to cover still. There, I want to go back to 221 real quick. I don't think we can spend a whole lot of time on it, but I, I do want to at least cover it. And as I'm looking at my note, I can see that Talk to Text has butchered it. So I'm going to try my best to decipher what these notes are. Um and if you can help me, that's that's great, too. On 221, uh, an aim, an ambition, provides the structure necessary for action. An aim provides a destination, a point of contrast against the present, and a framework within which all things can be evaluated. An aim defines progress and makes such progress exciting. An aim reduces anxiety, because if you have no aim, everything can mean anything or nothing. And neither of those two options make for tranquil spirit. Thus, we have to think and plan and limit and posit, and (laughs) I always struggle with that word, and uh, in order to live at all. An aim. Listen, man, like, this is what I keep talking about with the introspective thing. Uh, You might think I'm a, I don't know what you think I am. But it's a very important thing to be introspective, to go within yourself, to kind of investigate who you are, first off, and then figure out what you want, man. Like, you are blessed to have this life. Granted, you might have quite a bit of chaos in your life right now, but you're the fastest swimmer, bro. You're here. (laughs) You know? Like, do something with that opportunity. Figure out what it is you want to do with that opportunity and start aiming towards it. All right. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. If you don't, I've got a Country Boy Book Club motto that Peterson gifts us on page 223. It is a t-shirt slogan. T-shirts are on the print or on the press right now. Maybe they're not, but they might be. Page 223. You are by no means only what you already know. You are also all that which you could know 
if you only would. I'm going to read it again. You are by no means only what you already know. You are also all that which you could know if you only would. This is what we're talking about, man. Like, there's so much to learn in this life. Like, it's endless. Think about, oh, man. Oh, man. Just, like, the improvements you can create for yourself. Just if, like, you keep an open mind and are willing to learn something new. And are willing to learn something new. Like, Speaking proper English. <laughs> oh, man. And I I've think got... it's the next chapter that kind of talks about that. Uh, I think the I think the next chapter is um, assume that the person you're listening to might know something you don't. So, yeah. Yeah. That's a really good one. Another T-shirt quote is on 224. Oh, wait. That's the one we already covered. That's the atheist quote, 224. We've been there. Done that. Okay. 226 is my next note. I don't know if I'm stepping on your toes or not, but I'm going to keep stepping until you say ouch. Page 226. Uh, Peterson provides some pretty clear uh, direction from, you know, some of some of us that may have been wandering aimlessly. And listen, like, I've been there. Uh, I have friends that are still there. It's Okay. But but listen to this. It goes right hand in hand with what we were just talking about a minute ago. Everyone needs a concrete, specific goal, an ambition, and a purpose uh, to limit chaos and make intelligible uh, sense of his or her life. Set goals that you actually want to achieve. And, I mean, you'll find a path forward. The, the first part, and like this is what, um, you know, this is what I was talking with you about not too long ago about the vision board, you know, and all that is like, you, do you know what you want? You know, do you know what you're after, what you're pursuing? And if you don't, that's okay. And maybe you think you do. I don't think I've got it fully figured out on my end. And so that's why I kind of want to do stuff like that vision board to kind of back into, okay, well, that, that's what I thought the picture was, but what does the whole picture really look like? Right. Um, and I've kind of, cause I'm, I'm, I'm like not that person, um, that, um, that looks really, really far into the future. Um, <laughs> and that vision board just a hundred percent just helped me a lot. Like just looking at it and just being like, Oh, this is the goal. Like, yeah, sure. It's, um, it, it's this, but that leads to that. Yep. Leads to that. Yep. Um, something as simple, as simple as that kind of, kind of opened my eyes and let me see, um, kind of putting this chapter together for me. Um, sure. So, yeah. Mm, that's so cool to hear those ducks in the background. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what, man? That's about all the notes I have for this chapter. The The bottom line is like, uh, in, in true Peter, like if you were to go and read the last three to five pages of each chapter, each rule, I mean, really, that's all you you need, and that's one thing that I appreciate I appreciate about Peterson is like, you know, this book could have been, uh, like forty pages long, and it would have been just about as beneficial as this entire book. But what he does in both this book and his lecture is like. Well, he's, he's got this this incredible talent in which he's able to just tie together all this. First off, he has all this knowledge, right? Like he's done all this research. He's just he seems to be this infinite source of history. The the amount of research this man has done on history alone is astounding. It's a life work, right? But what he does in these chapters is 
he 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 gives so many different examples of why those last three to five pages are what they are. You know, he's able to back up everything with so much substance and and real definable examples. And so I guess well, basically what I'm getting at is you're only going to get so much with us. And, you know, we're glad that you're here for, for more than maybe what you think. You know, we, we, we hope you're reading the book along with us. And we really want to hear what you're getting out of this. You know, what are we missing? What is your, your, your perspective on some of the things that we've discussed? You know, we, we want to hear it. So maybe that's reaching out to us via email. We'll provide our emails. Maybe it's leaving a comment on, you know, your, your platform of choice. Um, but we want to hear it. I want to take, um, I want to take like 60 seconds. Okay. And so we're, we're basically stopping our notes at 226, 227. Yep. Um, I want to go through some of the things I have written down just so people can be like, oh, God, we're missing so much by not reading the book yourself. Um, he, 227, he kind of starts talking about um, how life turns into hell. Mm. Um, and it's straight up, it, it doesn't get into hell until you start lying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he goes over um, um, he goes in uh, he talks about um, a family whose house was torn down by an earthquake. Um, you're less likely to build that household, that family back together um, if you're all trying to stab each other in the back and lying to each other right um. Um, and then he talks about actually, um, hell comes later. Hell comes when lies have destroyed the relationship between individual or state and reality itself. Things fall apart. He says things falls apart three different times on three different pages. Um, you know why? Because they important. do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. With lying. Um, and I'm not going to get into it. You need to get the book. You need to read it yourself. Um, he also, we skipped over the part of the logos, which is where, um, the God's word created order from the chaos. That's the logos. At the end of the chapter, he compares us to God because we also transform chaos into being through speech. We transform in manifold possibilities of the future into the actualities of past and present um and that's at the very top of the last that's this line here mm -hmm. and you have the rest of the page yeah look at uh, all those it, lines it, yeah I, I have i have this whole chapter just about yeah yeah um we we i mean seriously guys we can't i, I mean oatmeal. yeah yeah, we, we just can't cover it all. And, uh, and all right, so one of two things has happened in which one of three things has happened in which you are watching this right now. Either you are a family member, <laughs> maybe a friend of ours, or you have the book and you're looking for supplemental uh, information, which we can't provide you. But what we can provide is a community in which we can discuss this stuff together. Or you're just interested in stuff like this. You're on a similar path to us, and somehow the algorithms have aligned, and here we are. Um, so if you don't have this book and that third example, that's what we're doing. We're encouraging you to, to catch back up because it's totally worth uh, the purchase. It's totally worth the read. Um, and, yeah, we're glad you're here because if you made it this far, you, thanks. <laughs> Oh, and, we've been and, at this one for a while, and hopefully I'm not, hopefully I'm not kicking myself whenever I say this because I mean, with, with the the channels just kind of started, I have no idea um, how many views this is going to get if it's going to get any. If 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 you enjoy the content, if you have this book and you're reading it, um, we've told you to like 
put comments about about what you like, what you don't like, what we missed, etc. If you don't have this book, if you're not listening to it on Audible, whatever way that you can, go read the comments and find out what you're missing. Yeah. Yeah. You know what, man? I mean, sure. Like, maybe you can't afford the book right now. Let It's our responsibility to, to kind of discuss this, um, the subjects in this book for those people as well, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, we've got time. Listen, you only, you might only want to sit here for however long and watch this episode, but after the fact, we can keep coming back to this thing and keep unpacking these issues. And I'm happy to do that. I'll see you in the comments, you know, um, yeah, reach yeah. out to us. Send an email. Yeah. Send a but, pigeon. Yeah. Send a carrier pigeon. You sure. The, the swamp. Don't, That's my address. Don't the swamp. shoot the pigeon, okay? Don't shoot the pigeon. I don't eat but, pigeons. Okay. <laughs> Yet. Um, but yeah, I think you touched on a great one. Um, yeah, I, I guess we do have a responsibility. There are, there are people watching this right now that might not be able to uh, afford this book. So we do have a responsibility to unpack all the, the, the content that's in there. Um, we can't do that right now, primarily because we've got to go to bed. <laughs> but we've got time to keep getting into this thing. So please uh, let us know what you're getting out of this chapter. Uh, point out some stuff that we missed. Uh, so... You know, everybody can benefit from it and holy crap how are you still here thank you for sticking this out with it we, uh, with us we can't stress enough how much we appreciate you being here uh, genuinely um, pretty impressive that you were even listening to this right now so thank you uh, next week we've already read the chapter we've already read the rule I'll read it one more time just to kind of reiterate where we're going next week. Rule number nine. Assume that the person you are listening to might know something that you don't. Alright folks, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for being here. 